Garen Emig with us on 107.7 The Franchise. Are you into? Uh, are you are you into the whole bringing your child to the press conference sort of thing? Did he do it again last night? I didn't stick around for the press. I don't conference think so. Last night. I don't think so. Listen oh, to that. The media so? guy. The media guy didn't stick around for the press conference last night. Gosh, I would have thought that if there was one presser that Curry would ever want to bring cover to, it was last night after after what he did. Um. He was bad. He was really bad. So where where are you? Where do you stand on that stuff? On the on bringing the kids to the presser? Yeah. Oh, I don't care. But you know what? It's never affected me. I mean, I've never. Oh, you players. A few of them have kids, but they're not to the stage of bringing them to the press conference yet. So right. It hasn't. It hasn't ever affected me. So I. I mean, let's just say that. I mean, if I go to the Oklahoma Tennessee game next September, it's which will probably be a night game, and I've got to crank crank out a story in about thirty minutes, and I need at least a couple of quotes from a key player. I'm probably a little chap that said player has his kid up at the pre- at the podium, but I don't think I'm going to have to worry about that. So, to me, to me, it's it's kind of cute, but again, I'm not one of those journalists that actually has to turn a story around in a half hour at that at that event. Garen Eming is with us here on on uh, 107.7 the franchise from the Tulsa World. Uh, Garen, I, I, I have this mental image of like you sitting in the back seat with Dog the Bounty Hunter while Beth is driving and you guys are all looking for Dalton Wood. Is that what's going on right now? <laughs> no. No, we have not reached uh, DEFCON Joe Mixon status yet. It, it hasn't gotten to the point where we're trying to find – where we're, we've got like – we've got the GPS out, we've got the trackers, we've got the radar, and we're trying to find out where he is. Uh, I think we, we almost got to that point with Mixon after his uh, – his little stunt at Pickleman's last summer, but thankfully this summer everyone has, I think, kept the lid on it for now. Although June June brings out the crazy and and everybody because there's nothing else to do. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if I end up in McAllister before this is over. Well, um, what what is the latest with that? Well, there really isn't any. So um, he's still not back on campus, obviously. Not that I know of. If he is, he's snuck in in the dead in the dead of night without anyone finding out uh we're, we're sort of where we were last week and that he was on campus for just a few hours and then decided to go back home man does that how how often has that happened in your career garen where where, where, a, play, where, where a player will just he for whatever reason he shows up and then uh, without get without knowingly getting into trouble he yeah. he just disappears well, I think it's it's unusual for a kid to show up and then leave. I think a lot of a lot of guys, I think, get cold feet, Zach. I do, and I think that in that case, they they try to delay <laughs> delay the arrival as long as possible. Either they've heard the horror stories of what it's like to do summer conditioning under Jerry Schmidt, or they you know they've got the, the girlfriend they don't want to leave, or they're, they're just you know maybe you know, again you know twenty third hour indec- indecisiveness. It happens. Um, what makes this story, I guess, again, a little unusual is the fact that the kid, if he never showed up, I think everyone would be, um, at all, I think everyone would be, well, yeah, he's just getting cold feet and he's trying to decide. But the fact that he came to Norman uh, that, that night, whatever night that was, I can't, I can't remember now, that, that makes it a little unusual. I, I, was, ta- I was talking to uh, Eric and Kelly Friday because we don't even really know the reason, the exact reason why he's, he's doing this. I mean, it's easy to jump to conclusions and think the worst. You know, it's it is possible that the guy, you know, he, he thinks he can go home and sort of sort out whatever he's going through and then come back with everyone's blessing. I mean, it could be just a simple matter of you know I've got, you know, I think I've got the coach's blessing to do this, but I really don't. You know, I mean, I obviously he doesn't. Or Kel Gundy wouldn't have called his high school coach the morning after he disappeared, saying where where the hell is this guy? So. um Let's just. I, I guess I'm willing to give this another few weeks at least before we before we put Dalton Wood to, out the pasture as far as his OU career is concerned. Garen Emig with us, our Sooners insider on 107.7 The Franchise. You can check out his work at TulsaWorld.com. Uh, five All-Americans on Phil Steele's preseason All-American team and uh, relatively little love comparative to other years preseason-wise for Oklahoma as a, as a team. What yeah. are we missing there? Well, I actually, you know, I actually thought there were more guys on there on his all. You talk about all American, not all Big Twelve, right? Correct. Yeah, I mean, Phil still has yeah. four teams. By the way, I mean, I want to make that clear yeah, too. Right. Four teams and five yeah. All Americans, two of which 
Uh, only two of which are on the first two teams, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I actually thought that was more than they get. <laughs> well, me too, but I, I, I mean, I, I mean, college football has got to be the most inclusive sport. We've got 8,000 bowls, and now Phil Steele's got four yeah, All-American Everybody teams. gets a ribbon, correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know what? I think Phil and some of the other national guys, they, they tend to fall in love with Oklahoma during the summer, whether it's uh, guys who crank out the magazines or guys filling the airspace on ESPN. I think I think because of Stoops and because of the history and because you, you look at, at that you know, first layer of talent and you see guys like uh, Stryker and Sanchez and Shepard, you think he's got some stuff to work with. It doesn't make any sense that they just went 8-5 and five and got their butt handed to him by Clemson in the bowl game. And so you, I think that the tendency is to think, oh, they're, you know, Stoops, Stoops will play the uh, chip-on-a-shoulder card and they're going to bounce back with fury. And I think, and I think those of us around here are a little more rooted in reality and see that they do have a lot of, they do have some serious first tier talent. You know, they had 12 guys on his all on seals, all big 12 spot. Uh, but they just don't have the depth of talent that it takes to, to compete right now with TCU and Baylor. And therefore we're more realistic. We, we don't, we see, we see, whereas others seem 11 and one, we see, you know, eight and four. And I, so I, I just think that we're in, we're in a better, we, we have a better view of the program as it's, where it stands right now, I think, than guys like Bill Steele. So in, in your mind, it would be lack of overall talent, I mean, i.e. depth, more so than it is uh, the coaching mishaps, coaching mis- misfortune, bad coaching, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah, no, I don't know. I, I think it's it's a combination. Don't yeah, don't. I, I, the, the the talent from one to twenty two is not nearly what it was uh, ten years ago or twelve years ago when they were at their peak. That much is true, but I also think there have been some some bad mistakes with regard to coaching. I, you know, the the biggest to me, the biggest mistake that Bob Stoops has made in his sixteen years as head coach was trying to. Fit the square peg. What is it? The old square, square peg in the round, round hole. hole. He, he, cha- he changed offenses, but he didn't change offensive coordinators two years ago. That was a terrible mistake. Josh, Josh, for, to, to, to me, having Josh Heupel get away from what he loves doing and what he's comfortable doing to running, you know, a zone read option type uh, Manziel esque offense was just was a terrible idea, and uh, it actually probably worked better than it should have. Well, it worked because. Knight got hurt, and then they went to Blake Bell, and Heupel was able to go back to what he what he trusted and, and was comfortable with, and Bell actually had a, three or four really good games in that offense. So, no, there, it's been both. It's been coaching and talent, or lack of talent. Well, Garen, what do you make then if that's, if that's you think, the biggest mistake Stoops has made? And personally, I think it's punting to Tyreek Hill twice. but <laughs> or, or winning the Sugar Bowl. Those are probably the two biggest mistakes. Uh, no, but seriously, if that's one of the biggest mistakes, isn't Lincoln Riley kind of the same – Offense that Josh Heupel ran two years ago, right? That's again. That's that's a little perplexing that he brought in he brought in a guy to run sort of the offense that yeah that Heupel would have been fine running. Um, <laughs> I I just think well I think there was uh, I don't I'm not not to say Heupel is a scapegoat in this because Heupel you know Heupel made some, you know made some mistakes as well and got I think got a little comfortable like a like guys like Jackie Ship and guys who've been on the staff you know a long time it, it, it was probably I mean it wasn't just done for semantics Hi, Stoops doesn't think that way he didn't just you know knee jerk and fire Heupel and say okay I'm going to get the hot young coordinator from East Carolina so I, I see that but it is a little interesting um, and I also think that it gives what you know the dangerous thing is. Oklahoma loses that game in Knoxville next September, 41-31, and they rack up almost 500 yards of offense, and whoever's quarterbacking looks great. Can you imagine the firestorm that's going to come down on, on the Stoops brothers? We're, we're right back to, wait a minute, wait a minute. He, he jettisoned the wrong guy, didn't he? I mean, we kind of thought he did, but, but this proves that he did. So uh, It's not so much that he that he could have kept Heifel around. It's that, it's that he did keep. Mike Stoops around. I think that's going to it's going to be what fans really jump on if this team has problems again next fall. We talked about this a little last week, Garrett, and I know you probably were clapping your hands and jumping up and down and rejoicing when you saw 11 a.m. for OU Tulsa. 
But last year, a lot of OU fans really griped and moaned about so many 11 a.m. kickoffs. What's your take as a media member and uh, as as a guy that's at these games and hearing from fans and other media members and people with the university? What's your take on all these 11 a.m. kickoffs? Well, it, it's Todd, it's interesting because we've sort of swung from one extreme to the other. I think it was just what three or four years ago OU was playing all the prime time games. And I remember it was a game, I think, in Lawrence at Kansas where they got home in the dead of night, and I believe that's when Joe Castiglione picked up the phone and called Tim Allen, the Big 12 TV guy, and said, look, enough is enough. You've got to get us off this, you know, get us under the sun, not the lights for a change, because it's killing us, uh, especially when we're on the road. So they, 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 they sort of swung back the other way. Now it's Oklahoma can't play, uh, can't play late enough for their liking. Um, I, you know, as a media guy, I think it's terrific because I get my work done to get home and watch the primetime game at 7. That's, that's bliss during, during football season. But I'll say this. You, you, put, I mean, you put an 11 o'clock game at, at Owen Field versus a 7 o'clock game, it's, it is, uh, it's not, we're not in the same league in terms of atmosphere and excitement. It's not just that it's hurting the economy or the merchants, you know, where you can't have fans come into town and spend, spend their time and money all day for a 7 o'clock or even a 6 o'clock kickoff, you can't get worked up over the game. I mean, you show up, you're still rubbing the sleep out of your eyes. Uh, you're drinking beer only because you're supposed to, not because you want to, and then they're just, you're, you're asleep by halftime. So I, I don't blame OU for being hot, but I also understand the fact that if you want to get off at 11 o'clock, it might be a good idea to do better than 8-4 and four, or 8-5, and five, as the case were last year. I know you're excited about it, Garen, but that Coney Islander's not going to taste as good at 9.30, 10 in the morning as it would in the afternoon. That Coney Islander always tastes good. Yeah, good point. You're right on that. That's, 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 that's good. At, you know, when you got to get up and let the dogs out at 4 a.m., it tastes good. I don't think Zach McCride has ever experienced Coney Islander. Not yet. Not yet. Nope. Dude. I got, we got some, I, well, I, well, I think what it comes down to is I've got bad friends. I got bad co-working friends is what I've got that wouldn't even introduce me to something like that. Just real hey, what bad do you guys pre- hey, hey, real quick, when are you guys previewing the uh, U.S. Australia women's uh, tussle? I keep waiting for you to dive into your hour long preview of the, uh, the Alex fight and Alex Morgan's uh, hour long. Uh, Screw uh, that. No way. I'm out of here. If that happens, are you a soccer guy, Garen? Yeah, I'm a soccer guy. Don't. Oh, yeah. Garen, you're not supposed to say that, man. One I at a time, oh. Zach. I'm telling you, we're taking over the world. I should have hung up on you before you could even get that out because now you know Todd's going to do nothing but want to engage you, our Sooners insider, <laughs> on soccer talk during an entire segment. We, we could either talk Women's Cup or we could review uh, Barcelona's uh, 3-1 win over Juventus for the Champions League title on oh Saturday. I, I'll, I'll Sad way for Pirlo too. to go out, wasn't it? <laughs> And Buffon, right? Is that That's Jesus right. Last game in goal. Yeah. Oh, good God. Yeah. GG and Andrea will be missed. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna think. Give me five seconds. I'm gonna think of a football question to ask. So just so I can. No, we turn were this, talking football just then. Turn this tide. Real American football. Oh, oh, okay. Here we go. Got one. Got one to get you guys to shut up about soccer. I got one. Ready? Yes or no, Garen? This is the last one we will leave you with. And by the way, I'm joking about the soccer stuff. I think it's. Funny. I know you are. That's all right. Um, yes or no? We will have another Oklahoma football season in the future with only one Stoops on the coaching staff. Gosh, that's a great question. That really is a great question. Um, I'm going to say yes. But I, but boy, that is a that is a as flimsy yes as I've ever given. And boy, will that be an awkward moment when it does happen, if and when it does happen. Woo, that'd be I, awkward. If, if I'm going yes, it's like fifty point one percent to forty nine point nine. I mean, it's that's a great question. All right, let buddy. Me what it, well, let me well, let me let me know what the other if you fire that out to, to Shin or Bullet Bumpers Billow or one of your other. Or Gilman, or any of the other your other OU insiders. I'll be curious. Yeah, we'll, to know how they answer. That. Yeah, we'll start throwing that around. We'll start throwing that Garrett, around. Garrett, cool. And enjoy McAllister Detector Emig, and uh, let us <laughs> Detective Emig, and let us know if uh, you find anything. Yeah, then. yeah. Enjoy yeah, McAllister. Yeah. Swing by Pete's place and all those places in Krebs. Good Italian food there. All right, you'll be the first I'd like now. All right, see you, <laughs> see guys. you Garrett.